When we talk obstacles on our endeavor of getting the most out of our pretty cool meat suit for as long as possible, often cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegeneration, and type 2 diabetes come to mind. But what if I told you that the real canary in the coal mine is the silent dysfunction that takes place before any of that structural damage occurs. Silent dysfunction which is currently impacting the majority of adults on this beautiful floating rock. Dysfunction that can be acted upon right here, right now. And it's all up to you. Yo, yo, yo! What is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic way. Today, we are looking into how something as boring as the timing of our meals could be one of the most powerful tools that we have to stave off the dysfunction and precursors to the diseases associated with that Grim Reaper dude. Yeah, I'm not a fan of him either. This dysfunction that we speak of is insulin resistance, a silent metabolic situation in which key tissue types such as the liver hepatocytes and skeletal muscles myocytes become desensitized to the energy regulating hormone insulin, the hormone which acts as the key to open up the cellular gates for glucose uptake, putting it at the center of energy metabolism and thus life. This dysfunction often the result of decades of suboptimal lifestyle habits, including eating, leads to chronically high levels of serum glucose, which trigger a downstream flurry of inflammation-inducing systemically damaging effects over time. Effects which often manifest as the diseases of aging. So this tool we talk of today is circadian eating, or a strategy which combines two key components of our evolutionary history together. Early eating with extended periods of daily fasting. Because as crazy as it sounds, caveman Grubhub just wasn't a thing way back when. I don't know how they did it, but they did. Now, we fall back on this topic today after the release of some new and very interesting human data, which builds on this video from a few weeks ago, highlighting the potential for daily time-restricted feeding as a means for type 2 diabetes reversal and remission. And if you weren't aware, type 2 diabetes is essentially the clinical diagnosis for insulin resistance when it gets to health deteriorating levels, a place we don't want to visit. So in an effort to not get there, we will first be walking through this new intriguing data, then talk about what beneficial cellular and metabolic mechanisms turn on when we embark on an early eating protocol, and as always, finish up talking about how to strategically incorporate one into your life if that's something you wanna try. But before we get there, it is key to highlight what exactly circadian eating is. So you can make the clear and concise decision if becoming a dinner rebel is the path for you. This whole concept is around aligning your daily eating habits with the way we've evolved to eat in accordance with the innate evolutionary rhythms which govern our internal body clock and thus almost every single biological function that takes place within. These are our circadian rhythms or natural sleep-wake cycles which ebb and flow with the day-night cycles of the sun. And this circadian eating hypothesis has very simple principles. Consume energy when you're in the best bodily position to digest and metabolize it during the day and throughout the night enjoy a nice prolonged fast until the ceremonial breaking of the fast the next day. Where else did you think the word break fast came from? And here's the cool part. As the data continues to trickle out around this strategy, the case for doing it only becomes more compelling. Let's see if this new research continues the trend. A research group out of South Australia sought to see how two different ways of eating, early time restricted feeding and a calorie restricted diet, influenced the metabolic health for participants prone to type 2 diabetes. Here they recruited over 200 adults with increased risk and randomized them into one of three groups. An early fasting group, which ate all of their meals between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. on three non-consecutive days a week, 
being calorically restricted for these three days and eating ad libitum or whenever, whatever they wanted for the other four days, a caloric restriction group, which were limited to 70% of their daily energy requirements, but had no time restrictions, and a standard care control group, which were given a booklet with guidelines, but had to follow it on their own. This three-armed randomized controlled trial provided nutritional support to the early eating group and the calorically restricted group for a period of six months with an additional 12-month follow-up and no active guidance for the standard care control group. Hopefully the booklets had pictures. During this time, researchers' primary outcome was glucose tolerance, measured by a state-of-the-art mixed nutrient tolerance test. So what happened? Well, interestingly, Subjects who fasted for three days during the week showed a greater tolerance to glucose after six months compared to the daily caloric restriction group. In addition, it was also shown that the early eating group was more sensitive to insulin while also experiencing a greater reduction in lipids when compared to that same caloric restriction group. Now, it's important to call out that both interventions perform better than that standard care control group. I guess the booklets didn't have pictures. But as noted before, the early factor was definitely flexing its metabolic muscles. Oh, and speaking of muscles, more of them is one of the best tools we have to stave off disease, a topic we have an exclusive deep dive on here. As for how this circadian eating may be working its magic, the picture becomes much clearer if we first highlight how the modern day 24 seven all waking hours eating habits in combination with the ultra processed modern diet sets the stage for dysfunction in the first place. Here's how it tends to go wrong. Eating energy dense, nutrient scarce foods and doing this for the full waking day, typically spanning 14 to 18 hours, naturally creates an internal environment with chronically elevated glucose. And as a byproduct, chronically higher insulin because insulin wields the power of clearing glucose from the bloodstream. These chronically elevated levels of intracellular glucose have been shown to damage our critical energy producing organelles the mitochondria, making them less efficient and flexible, increasing our dependency on glucose while impairing our ability to use fatty acids as a result. But that's just the beginning. The dysfunction continues. This leads to more hormone imbalances, two notable ones being our hunger and satiety hormones, ghrelin and leptin, ultimately creating a biochemical illusion in the brain where we are not getting the satiety signal making us feel like we're hungry when in fact our cells are fully nourished. So more poor eating ensues. Over time, this energy influx and metabolic dysfunction leads to fat accumulation, especially in the visceral midsection, where all of our vital organs reside. And this fat happens to be good at poking the immune system in all the wrong ways, specifically by secreting cytokines, which elicit an inflammatory response which essentially damage all of the surrounding tissue, which happens to be organs like the liver, pancreas, and even heart, leading them now to begin struggling doing their job, which ironically enough, includes the job of producing insulin, which is owned by the pancreas. And when you compound this over the span of years to decades, it's no wonder that an estimated 88% of American adults are metabolically unhealthy. Long story short, we wanna get ahead of this dysfunction before it manifests as a cellular and metabolic shit show that drastically increases the odds, likelihood, and probability of us encountering one of the major age-related diseases before our 10th decade of life. And although it isn't a silver bullet, as no such thing exists in the health and longevity world, circadian eating seems to do a number of pretty solid things to help us on this endeavor. Let's see what exactly. First, it is important to reiterate that there is a lot of potential variation in a circadian eating routine. Of course. But in essence, it includes eating your meals during the waking day with emphasis of positioning your larger meals earlier and giving your body a solid 12 plus hour fast throughout the night. This right here leaves quite a bit of flexibility for the actual window itself, making not only 
the perfect protocol unique to each individual, but also wield different risks and rewards. Exactly why you want to talk these things over with a medical professional who is educated on these types of natural interventions. That being said, here are some mechanisms in which this circadian eating and early time restricted feeding combo is thought to work its cellular and metabolic magic. First, by yielding the natural biological byproducts associated with less stress and more rest. Meaning, it gives our cells time to respond to the energy we consume in an efficient manner, controlling both extra and intracellular stress and allowing repair and rejuvenation pathways to become active when finished. This naturally improves insulin sensitivity in two ways. First, by not allowing the cascade of events described before to take place, and second, by presenting energy when our cells are most equipped to metabolize it during the day. This has been one of the most interesting findings throughout all of this circadian eating research to date, as there has been a fair amount of data suggesting that key organs downregulate their function and capacity at night. This is thought to be due to the effect of several hormones such as melatonin inducing organs such as the liver and pancreas into rest and rejuvenation mode, which is great unless we're acting against those forces by having big late night meals. And when we are more insulin sensitive, we have a better ability to clear glucose from the bloodstream, thus increasing our glucose tolerance, as we saw in this latest research. In addition to all this, circadian eating has been shown to boost mitochondria function as well, as we recently reviewed here, enhancing our ability to transition from a dependency on glucose to the much more widely available fatty acids with ease, a key component of cellular fitness and metabolic health. And during those daily rest periods, our cellular self upregulates cleanup pathways such as autophagy and mitophagy, where our cells recycle the weak, damaged, potentially mutated parts, preventing them from growing into something harmful, keeping oxidative stress subdued in the process. Lastly, by doing all of this, it regulates longevity liability numero uno, chronic inflammation, preventing the unnecessary damage of overnutrition and increasing our odds, likelihood, and probability of cellular and metabolic efficiency and thus vitality over time. Now, these are most certainly not all of the pathways and mechanisms circadian eating acts upon, but I wanted to provide a look into the cellular changes that are thought to accompany a protocol like this and how it can be a tool in the toolbox for present day health and thus long-term longevity. But as we know, certainly not the only one, as paying attention to the foundational components of health and longevity are critical to sway the odds in your favor. We're talking prioritizing real whole nourishing food, high quality circadian aligned sleep, staying active, aka moving that badonka donk in an intentional methodical way, and getting out and interacting in the environment and elements we've evolved in for hundreds of thousands of years as homo sapiens and millions of years as primates. All topics we discuss in detail on this channel, and links to relevant videos will be in the description below. So, with that, what are the first steps into implementing a protocol like this into our lives? Let's get tactical. And in doing so, we cannot overlook the first word in circadian eating, circadian. This means being aligned internally with the day-night cycles of the earth. So staying up into the wee hours of the night and depriving yourself of sleep is one of the surefire ways to throw your internal body clock out of whack. Thus, slowly and sustainably standardizing on consistent wake and bedtimes, giving yourself an eight hour sleep opportunity between the hours of 8 p.m. and 10 a.m. is critical. This video discusses everything you need to know about getting realigned. Now, the eating part. As we talk about a lot on many of the fasting videos on this channel and all throughout the Fasting 101 playlist, consistent meal timing is proving to be one of the most powerful things that we can do to get our health back in line. And conveniently, it's one of the more doable health interventions out there. 
This simple structure is thought to better align us modern intelligent walking apes with the way we've evolved to eat. When it was light out, when we could hunt and scavenge for food, not waiting to indulge right before bed. As I mentioned before, there is no generic standard protocol that needs to be followed. The perfect protocol is always going to be the one that you can continuously sustain. In fact, that's the most important component. So here are some tips and guidelines to help you get started. First, baseline yourself. Observe your current day eating habits, specifically when you start and finish consuming anything with caloric value. Next, try and identify a goal feeding window, aiming for 12 hours or less, but ideally 10 hours or less during the day that can fit into your life, aka something that you can follow every single day, even on the weekends. An easy starting point could be something like 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Whatever it is, starting with a larger window and slowly condensing it is a great sustainable way to approach it. Once you have your starting point, begin to shave off a couple of minutes on each end, each and every week or every month until you get to your final goal. And during this time, focus on consuming your most energy dense meals a little earlier in the day, possibly shifting your largest meal to lunch rather than dinner or even breakfast. Finally, aim to finish your last meal around three hours prior to bed. This will help ease the digestive demand going into bed, optimizing your rest and recovery and things like sleep quality. But please, throughout all this, do not forget that sustainability is the most important piece of the puzzle. So start slow, ease into it, and remember, we're playing the long game here. So exploring and adjusting to fit your unique lifestyle variables is critical. If you want to see a breakdown of my personal strategy, which is always being modified and tweaked, you can check out this video here. In the end, know that one day or two or three of later eating is never going to metabolically break you. But after a little while of earlier eating, you'll most likely feel the difference when you eat late and see it objectively too if you measure things like sleep data. So go be your own N of one experiment safely and find your perfect protocol. You dinner rebel, you.